Welcome to Capital View, where we discuss the latest in state government and politics. I'm Hannah Meisel with NPR Illinois. Joining us this week is John Jackson, visiting professor of political science at Southern Illinois University's Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Thanks for being here, John. Sure, glad to be here. And also with us is Amanda Vinicky, political correspondent for Chicago Public Television Station, WTTW. Glad you're here, Amanda. I'm glad to be with you. Well, today I would like to have an informed discussion about, you know, we've seen so many hot takes, I think, in the last week or so uh, since the off-year uh, election last week when, you know, uh, folks like Democrat uh, Terry McAuliffe lost the governor's race in Virginia, though, you know, he uh, you know, kind of unexpectedly, or at least unexpectedly, if you're paying his own attention to only certain segments of, you know, media and analysis. Uh, Democrat Phil Murphy in New Jersey, he narrowly won re-election uh, to, to the governor's office. You know, and Democrats kind of had a rough go of it. Um, and given that Illinois is dominated by the Democratic Party, I thought it'd be useful to have a more informed discussion about, you know, maybe where we're heading, what we might see in a year when we get to the midterm elections, which is also when Governor J.B. Pritzker is up for his first reelect. So, you know, John, your initial thoughts about last Tuesday's election day, you know, what kind of, were you, I guess, surprised by the fact that Terry McAuliffe, who, by the way, Virginia is one of the, is the only state that uh, limits its governors to, you know, they can't do consecutive terms. And I looked back in the history and Terry McAuliffe is, you know, for 50 years, the only governor who tried again, uh, except for a governor who uh, was a Democrat in the 1960s and then ran again as a Republican uh, and was successful, you know, uh, very interesting. Maybe it doesn't actually have any bearing on what happens in Illinois. What do you think, John? Well, I think Virginia was important. I think it was bad news for the Democrats, uh, but for a little different reason, and that is because it became uh, the narrative the next day and has continued to be that this is a referendum on Joe Biden. This is a referendum on his policies. We in political science have a long research history on midterm elections. And we know some things that everybody now knows for sure. That is, the party in the White House is almost always going to lose in the House and Senate in the first midterm. Uh, you mentioned uh, the case of Virginia. That's a related trend there. They almost always vote against the party in the White House for the Virginia governor's race. So it's really a much bigger and more generic thing than that. Uh, the loss average is 28 seats in the House uh, and four seats in the Senate since World War II. Doesn't matter who was in the, doesn't matter who was president, who was the public policy issues, it's one of those things almost always happens. So it can be turned into a referendum on Joe Biden, but it's much more complicated than that. I won't go into the reasons that it's complicated, but I do think it's important for Joe Biden because he knows that he's just got less than two years to get his policies passed. That's why they've crammed everything into infrastructure, and now into the human resources bill. They've got what could have been 10 bills crammed into those because they know he was there for Obama and the Affordable Care Act in 2009 and 10, and he saw the disaster uh, for the Democrats in 2010, and he knows about Bill Clinton in 1994, and neither of them ever had a majority after that. Uh, and he knows that record. As for Illinois, I think it's complicated. I will say quickly, uh, I don't think it has a lot of import for the statewide races. I think all the statewide constitutional officer candidates, you should consider uh, the incumbent Democrats and the Democrats as the most probable. Uh, it would be unusual, I think, for any of those to win, not impossible. 
at the congressional level, I think it does have some impact. And I think there are only really maybe 11 of those congressional seats that are really Democratic seats, most likely, no matter what. But it's going to be a competitive and winds blowing against Democrat race anywhere outside the city, thus the old Underwood uh, uh, district uh, somewhat reconfigured and the Bustros district more reconfigured and let alone that downstate district, which is supposedly tailored for a Democrat. That'll be at best a competitive district, certainly not a Democrat pickup for sure. So I think 14 or 13 four is most likely outcome. And then finally, I do think it could make some difference in the Illinois House and Senate. I think Democrats could lose their supermajority, not lose the House and Senate, but lose the, the comfortable margin, because particularly those suburban districts will be much more competitive than they might have been. Sure. And, you know, Amanda, one of the things that I've been reading in all of these postmortems was, um, you know, the Terry McAuliffe campaign, you know, I'm not there. I, I don't cover Virginia politics, obviously. But um, one of the through lines from the critiques of folks, both, you know, in his own party and, you know, not in his party, is that maybe he didn't actually run the best campaign. And one of the things that he tried to do was tie his opponent, uh, Glenn Youngkin, who did win by a couple points there, um, to Donald Trump. And you know, there is some analog from Glenn Youngkin, a businessman who tried to stay away from the red meat, but still find a way to engage the, you know, kind of Trump base, um, you know, to Bruce Rauner, who we saw uh, come into Illinois, obviously a different time pre-Trump. We know that Trump has changed the GOP, uh, you know, forever probably. But, you know, one of the uh, disadvantages we have as political reporters, political analysts, is that we think we spend a lot of time thinking about politics, which are determined by voters who maybe don't spend a ton of time thinking about politics at all, uh, you know, unless they feel like, God, this is annoying. Why is everything so political these days? Um, it, we saw, uh, we saw J.B. Pritzker in 2018 uh, tie, um, you know, opponents, uh, Bruce Rauner, tie uh, Republicans down the ballot to Donald Trump. We also saw the same playbook, obviously, in, uh, you know, last year in 2020. Do you think that voters are buying that? I, I mean, there's a lot there, as you noted. I'm not in Virginia, and I think something that we need to keep in mind as everybody is making all of these calculus, what does this mean for the midterms, which are really about a year to the day from Tuesday away, is that all politics is local, unless you've met the candidate, know the candidate, know the local issues, have the background and the ties take a breath before tying it to what that might mean for Illinois, or as John noted, for any of the Democratic incumbents who have name recognition. You still have the money that Governor J.B. Pritzker has. We don't even know who's going to be in the GOP race to try to get the nomination to run against Pritzker. So there, there's really so much there. Uh, things are different from two years ago and two years prior to that. Uh, Donald Trump is not president. He is not currently on the ballot. And while he is most certainly weighing in on races, uh, he, I, I think, could come into play if he uses his platform to strike against or to endorse a particular candidate. But when what we saw with Youngkin, for example, OK, Youngkin walked the middle of the road. Trump sort of did, too. And that worked. And as you noted, it's not as if people are living and breathing their every day by what is happening in any of these races and who has endorsed a particular <clears throat> candidate or not. So um, I, I do think that the Trump effect, if you will call it that, is going to come into play. You look at races such as we might see if we have a Congresswoman Mary Miller running against Congress, uh, Congressman Rodney Davis in a new district that is seemingly tailored to Davis, but at the same time is 
maybe not, because if Miller tries to run there, uh, will he have issues? Because he hasn't, he isn't as conservative, as pro-Trump as she is. He's certainly going to weigh in on some of these races, but is that going to be the winning strategy at this point uh, for, uh, say, Pritzker? It seems as if that's not what he's counting on right now. If you look at his ads, he's counting on, I kept you safe. I followed the science with COVID. He's not talking about Trump because Trump is no longer on our TVs every moment of every day for candidates to react to. And John, you know, one of the things that we've seen in pre, uh, you know, last week's election, truly in the last year or so, um, is this pushback from within the Democratic Party, um, you know, saying that the left wing, the progressive wing that has truly, you know, we've seen it in Illinois, we've seen it in the General Assembly, we've seen it in uh, Chicago City Council before then, uh, we've seen it you know, a little bit in Congress too, that this progressive wing of the party has actually, you know, finally gotten some power, uh, you know, enough to be kind of a nucleus. And, but it seems as if a lot of people are pushing back and we should know, especially communities of color, uh, you know, folks who represent, say, the black community, who is traditionally maybe not as progressive as, uh, you know, those folks who hold out that wing of the party are trying to push it to be. So do you think there is merit there or do you think that that is a shot in the dark blaming by a party who, you know, doesn't really have a handle on their own voters anymore? Well, I don't think it's going to make much difference in Illinois because the people in charge now, particularly in the House and Senate in Illinois, are going to continue to be in charge. They're going to continue to mostly uh, be about some very progressive kind of legislation. Uh, and J.B. Pritzker is pretty progressive himself and, and takes some pride in that. Uh, I do think where it works is in the rural areas, but uh, I think that's a different story. And the rural areas, certainly uh, it's frightening to them that you can put Nancy Pelosi's uh, picture on the screen and start talking about socialism and start talking about Joe Biden's very left kind of uh, policy agenda. Uh, and that works in traditional Republican areas, whether they're Illinois or nationally. I do not think it's going to make a big difference uh, in local Illinois politics in the sense of the General Assembly level politics. Sure. And you know, we saw progressive, we saw blue, the blue wave of 2018 sweep a lot of. Uh, folks into office in the suburbs. And then of course, Democrats had the power of the pen for redistricting and they shored up those districts to kind of ensure that those folks won't be swept out of office uh, if an oppositional force comes along, Amanda. Yeah, and they certainly are doing their darndest. We will see how the new map plays out and will Democrats will actually get their wishes or if a series of lawsuits against those redrawn, redrawn boundaries will be successful and what that would mean for Democrats' attempts to shore up their margins. Um, I, I think what is interesting when you look at the General Assembly is, first of all, Again, who is going to be at the top of the ticket or even on the ballot when it comes to the GOP race for governor? Because what is that going to mean for fundraising? What is that going to mean for any potential down ballot races? Just where is the party going to go once we begin to see gubernatorial debates begin um, and you have some of the candidates um, who are certainly far more conservative or have views that align with, say, Trump, that clearly didn't uh, succeed and were not appreciated by some of these more purple suburban voters. Then again, uh, as John talked about, you, I, I think that there's going to be the effect of a of, of midterms. You have a Democrat in the, uh, the president's office. Um, there are also a whole lot of votes that Democrats in those suburban districts took that 
They did. I, I think some of them um, very excitedly, others really had to swallow hard. And we will be watching to see what suburban voters think of those things, such as the Parental Notification Act repeal, which requires minors to parents to be notified before they can have an abortion with a caveat that uh, uh, minors who have a reason, for example, for potentially uh, an abusive relationship with a parent or guardian could have a judicial workaround. The governor has not yet, but is expected to sign that into law. That is something that the, some of the polling that we've seen is something that those more moderate voters aren't going to be happy with. Will the GOP have the money to make the case that in under Democratic control, things have swung too far to the left? Will increases in crime that we are seeing in Chicago, that we are seeing across the country, be something that Republicans can tie to the newly passed with only Democratic support criminal justice overhaul. So um, these are some really big changes that'll be fairly fresh. I think, again, we're just going to see how much does that matter to moderates, it, particularly as we are going to see presumably down the road, as we're seeing inflation rising, new issues with the economy, with the pandemic, and also a GOP in Illinois that still does not have the, the chutzpah or the moolah that the Democrats do. Yeah, no, that's 100% correct. I mean, we've, we have not seen a strong Illinois Republican Party and sometime we saw it briefly propped up uh, by, of course, Bruce Rauner's wealth. But, you know, basically for the same decade plus, they've been running the same message uh, that House Speaker, former now House Speaker Mike Madigan, is corrupt and he controls everything in Illinois. Well, you know, it's kind of like an analog to Trump. He's no longer in office. He's, uh, you know, how well will that message work anymore? Uh, when also, ironically, I guess uh, you could say, uh, Madigan was also a kind of firewall to, uh, you know, progressivism. It wasn't until, you know, his last kind of years in office that he saw the political winds wind changing and he allowed some more progressive things to uh, go through, uh, you know, his house. But, um, you know, he, 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 he also, he always, he, he, he knew messaging he knew how to temper messaging right john i mean is messaging kind of something that democrats need to worry about whether it's in illinois or nationally you know things like okay you want an infrastructure plan maybe talk about the benefit to folks and maybe stay a little less out of the ivory castle kind of jargon about why this will benefit people and why it's necessary well, absolutely. The Democrats have, as long as I can remember, had a terrible problem with messaging, and they don't reduce their messages to bumper stickers. They don't do a good job of appealing to the visceral uh, emotions of politics. They don't uh, latch on to something like critical race theory and run with it successfully. And that, I think, brings us to the infrastructure business. What they do well, I think, it seems to me, is to pass these very heavy laden policy oriented things that have very practical implications. Uh, this bill that just passed is truly historic. They've got to compare it with the interstate highway system. They've got to say this is the biggest thing since the interstate highway system under Dwight Eisenhower in 1957. And they've got to make that case that it is going to benefit everyone. It's got money in there for the cities. It's got money in there for the rural areas. And they've got to go out and sell that in a way that people can relate to it. And one other point that we talked about earlier, this is going to be a godsend for J.B. Pritzker and for Illinois in the sense that he got that bill, bipartisan support, in the spring of 19 or 2019, and he's got Illinois better positioned than perhaps anyone to take advantage because all these projects demand a local and state match, uh, and that has been a problem. And these 
projects. Many of them are on the drawing boards. Some of them are out there on the road tying up traffic already. And this was not only a one shot or two years, this was a permanent increase and that money is in place and it won't be a problem for Illinois to come up with. And it allows J.B. Pritzker on the budget front to say, look, I've been fiscally responsible. We're making progress. Look at all the things we're doing. This will create jobs. This will create more income that they can deal with next year. Uh, so it comes back around to being a real benefit for J.B. Pritzker uh, in terms of all the things he can talk about. Uh, and it was bipartisan because it really wouldn't have passed without uh, those Republicans, including Kinzinger, uh, without their help. And now they're getting death threats, by the way. So that's yeah. part of the ugly under, underbelly of American politics at this point. 13 yeah. of those guys made the difference on the Republican side. And that's a really good point that Illinois is poised to take advantage of this $1.2 trillion uh, bipartisan uh, bill, uh, infrastructure bill that is you know, heading to Joe Biden's desk, you know, especially because we've seen this movie before where if people don't, if voters don't feel an immediate benefit, they might not be able to tie those things in their minds together. And so if it takes years for say in other states, infrastructure projects to get off the ground, they might not, you know, see, it, it'll be a harder sell for Democrats to say, we did this, you know. I, one other thing I wanted to say about messaging before we move into some more meat of the infrastructure bill is, uh, you know, we d we have seen a, a failure on messaging from J.B. Pritzker not too long ago. He lost that uh, so-called fair tax. He lost the three-year campaign that he engaged in as a very uh, early candidate to do the pro the graduated income tax. So, you know, we'll see if he, he does better on messaging in uh, his campaign next year, not just for himself, but for all the Democrats down the ballot. But Amanda... Um, let's talk a little bit more about what's in this infrastructure package for Illinois. We would get $17 billion of that $1.2 trillion, correct? Yeah. And so, I mean, again, to me, I actually, speaking of messaging, wanting to hone in on sort of the failures of the Democrats when we look back to last week's elections, when we look forward to Illinois' next elections. So you've got the infrastructure bill and then the quote unquote, I, I mean, people seem to describe it as the reconciliation bill, the, the twin bill, the paired bill. What does that mean to anybody? I mean, a lot of actually what I think really makes a difference to voters. Um, yes, they want nice roads. They want their bridges to be updated. I don't know how much <laughs> voters necessarily appreciate or tie it to any politician when they're driving through traffic and there are construction cones and they're annoyed by it. Um, I, I think politicians, of course, like the ribbon cutting and they like to be present for it. Uh, John, I'd be interested if you have any studies that really, you know, tie the legislators and the lawmakers and the congressional or state level who vote for those programs into whether voters actually notice who did or didn't vote yes, because the money comes into those districts regardless. Um, in terms of the Build Back Better messaging, those are the sort of things I think that really could, if it passed, be noticeable to families right away on the front end when you think at things uh, about things like um you know tuition for community college uh family leave uh, free school for your kindergarten ch child that can't get it elsewhere as you're struggling with child care expenses i mean those are the sort of things that make a true quick material difference and First of all, we don't know what is actually going to pass at this juncture, and that message has been so clouded and taken up all of the oxygen, whether that is the, fort, uh, the, the fault of the Beltway media, whether that is the fault of uh, members of Congress and their spokespeople who I think have really failed on that messaging. And again, that's where we in part can attribute some of the results in the most recent elections. Democrats in general are going to have to turn that messaging around if they are going to vote for these packages and want to ride on them and 
bring that home to voters. So far, they have been incredibly lackluster at doing so. And again, I think on the state front, there is some difficulty with doing that in some of these districts because what Democrats see as achievements may not be perceived as such by the more moderate voters that they are wanting to keep blue or turn blue. John, I'll let you have the word, last word in 10 seconds or less. Do you think that this so-called human infrastructure bill will be successful? I think it probably is going to pass. Uh, I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it, but I think the president talking as confidently as he's been talking, he must think that he's got cinema and mansion on board. And it depends on the congressional budget uh, estimations. They could hide behind that if they come in bad, but if they come in reasonable, I think it'll pass. All right. Well, we are out of time for this week's edition of Capital View. I'd like to thank our guests, Amanda Vinicky, uh, John Jackson. I'm Hannah Meisel. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week on Capital View.